Erdogan won Turkey's election. But this is not the end of the story. This past weekend, Turkey's voters rejected liberal democracy in favor of populism. Sunday's runoff in the country's presidential elections yielded a clear win for Recep Tayyip Erdogan. 52% of Turkey's voters said they approved of President Erdogan's pledge to make Turkey great again. Despite obvious economic mismanagement, they believed Erdogan would steer Turkey toward a path of imperial grandeur. Erdogan used all the advantages of being an incumbent, state resources, media control, favorable election laws, to beat up on his opponent. His rival, 74-year-old Kemal Kılıçdaroğlu, is a former civil servant who emerged as the lead candidate after a more popular opponent, Istanbul Mayor Ekrem İmamoğlu, was subjected to a sham trial in January 2022 and disqualified from running. During the campaign, possibly Turkey's most divisive, Kılıçdaroğlu was targeted for his Alevi identity, accused by Erdogan of being pro-LGBTQ and of being supported by terrorists. In campaign rallies, Erdogan showed fake videos that depict Kurdish separatist PKK leaders singing the opposition's campaign song. So what if it is a fake? Erdogan said. Farid Zakaria, Turkey points to a global trend, free and unfair elections. Turkey's geopolitical orientation was also on the ballot. Erdogan said President Biden was supporting his rivals, while the opposition complained of Russian interference, with Kalikdaroglu going so far as to tweet in Russian warning Moscow to stay out of the race. Erdogan had been increasingly drifting from the transatlantic orbit and developing closer ties with Russia. To stave off Turkey's economic problems, he managed to secure financial backing from Russia, Saudi Arabia, the United Arab Emirates and Qatar in the form of central bank loans, which allowed him to provide handouts and wage increases in the run-up to elections. It was therefore a win not just for the Turkish leader but also for the global club of autocracies. This is not the end of the story for Turkey, however. Erdogan might be in power for another five years, and those five years will almost certainly further hollow out institutions and entrench authoritarian political habits in the country's psyche. But the election was closely fought, even if it was not free and fair. While Erdogan might well see the results as an approval for his domestic policies and his non-aligned geopolitical course, he should not get overconfident. The country is deeply polarized and though a slim majority was swayed by his populist message, an economic reckoning looms. Turkey's central bank reserves are once again in the negative territory. Economists are worried about currency devaluation or capital controls to prevent a financial panic over the next few months. Turkey will break your heart, an exiled Turkish journalist warned me more than two decades ago. It has, over and over again. Sunday, it happened one more time. And yet 25 million Turkish citizens across the nation had the courage to vote for Kılıçdaroğlu's opposition platform despite incessant state propaganda, sectarian provocations and election day irregularities. That number, 25 million, is greater than the population of most European countries and is a testament to Turkish society's enduring democratic resilience. Those 25 million hail from Turkey's major cities and prosperous coastal regions, and represent the professional, educated classes. They want change, and will not be easily bought off or distracted. Over the weekend, Turkish star Merv Dizdar was awarded Best Actress at the Kin Film Festival for her role in About Dry Grasses. She dedicated her prize to all the rebellious souls in Turkey waiting to live the good days that they deserve. The election results tell us that their dreams can be postponed but cannot be quashed. Erdogan must not forget that. Erdogan won Turkey's election. But this is not the end of the story. This past weekend, Turkey's voters rejected liberal democracy in favor of populism. Sunday's runoff in the country's presidential elections yielded a clear win for Recep Tayyip Erdogan. 52% of Turkey's voters said they approved of President Erdogan's pledge to make Turkey great again. Despite obvious economic mismanagement, Biden's underrated deal-making prowess strikes again. 
President Biden's capacity to overperform after an onslaught of negative press and Democratic hand-wringing is second to none. He did it with the Inflation Reduction Act, the Bipartisan Infrastructure Law, NATO solidification and expansion, and now with the debt ceiling deal. It's hard to conceive of an outcome more favorable to Biden. Recall where this began, the Republican House Freedom Caucus making promises such as repealing much of the Inflation Reduction Act, including eliminating $80 billion in new funds for the Internal Revenue Service, capping non-defense spending at fiscal 2022 levels for a decade and blocking Biden's $400 billion proposed student debt relief. None of that happened. When factoring in agreed-upon appropriations adjustments, the deal holds non-defense spending essentially flat in fiscal 2024 and increases it by 1% in fiscal 2025. According to White House aides, that's a better outcome than a straight continuing resolution. As for blocking $80 billion in new IRS funding, an expenditure Republicans had basically characterized as helping enlist an army of jackboot thugs to knock down your door, the deal would repurpose $10 billion from fiscal 2024 and another $10 billion from fiscal 2025 appropriations to be used in non-defense areas, further lessening the blow to non-defense discretionary programs. But the IRS reportedly will have discretion to shift spending in the funding's 10-year window so that the deal has little near-term impact. A decade from now, the country will have a new president, a new Congress and almost certainly a new budget framework. To sum up, Biden brushed back the litany of outrageous demands, kept his spending agenda and tax increases intact and got his two-year debt limit increase. And in making a deal with House Speaker Kevin McCarthy, Republican California, Biden helped stoke dissension on the GOP side as the extreme MAGA wing denounces the agreement. During the process, Democrats, as they frequently do, confused PR with substance. They fretted that McCarthy was getting more and better media coverage. They worried Biden was giving in to Freedom Caucus demands. Biden and his team understood something they did not, the momentary spin McCarthy produced is irrelevant. His right-wing crazies still hate the deal, Democrats still get the deal they wanted all along. Biden, like a prosecutor who lets his filings do the talking, lets his deals do the talking. Moreover, Biden could not very well run to the press to tell them McCarthy wasn't getting much of anything. The play here was to allow McCarthy to spin his way out of the corner that he and the Freedom Caucus had painted themselves into. Letting McCarthy boast that his great achievement was getting Biden to negotiate was a small price to pay for avoiding economic catastrophe and landing the best deal one could hope for in divided government. The media coverage both during the process and after predictably took the frame of horse race politics. Who won? Who lost? It's hard to avoid the conclusion that Biden got a far better deal than the media expected or gave him credit for. In underrating Biden's accomplishments, the mainstream media is able to maintain the pretense of neutralism. And portraying McCarthy as a rational dealmaker